Um, I just want to start with the online safety bill. So people who encourage others to self-harm uh, on the internet, via social media perhaps, now face criminal prosecution. And this, of course, comes after the really sad case of Molly Russell, uh, who took her own life when she was just 14 years old. What I'm confused about is, is this just applying to children or will it cover adults as well? Well, look, pe people don't have very much longer to wait. The, the second day of debate in the House of Commons on this important piece of legislation uh, is going to take place on Monday the 5th of December in just over a week's time. And as is the proper process, ministers will set out uh, any government amendments there are to the legislation um, at the dispatch box in the House of Commons. So you'll just have to be a little bit more, little bit more patient. At, at the same time, though, I mean, this has been briefed out today. I'm not just jumping on this because I want to find out. You, you know, you, you guys are putting this out today. What, well, why, don't, why don't we know what the details well, are? Th there's often speculation in the media about what is or isn't going to be in pieces of legislation. This isn't speculation, ministers, this has been briefed out. Well, there's often speculation in the media. I, I think it's better if ministers set out any plans that there are uh, in the House of Commons at the dispatch box, and then they can set out all of the detail about what the government proposes uh, and allow people to take questions on it. So, look, it, it's coming to the House of Commons. I know it's an important piece of legislation. It'll actually be groundbreaking legislation globally. Ministers have worked on it, and I know campaigners uh, like Mr Russell have worked on it for... Uh, you know, campaigned on it for many years, but we're going to have that day, that further day of debate uh, in just over a week's time um, and all, all will become clear about what the government's plans are at that point. I mean, you say it's groundbreaking and it clearly is. You know, lots of parents really worried about <clears throat> it, but not just parents. You know, th mm -hmm. This is something that affects so many people as well. And so I, I guess that's why I'm just trying to find out who it applies to. It feels like quite a big deal to me, you know, if it's just children or if it's everybody. Well, well look, ministers have taken a lot of trouble to get this right and there have been, you know, there have been lots of people wanting to make sure we protect children, which is absolutely right. And then there have, of course, been people who are very concerned about getting the balance right about free speech. So ministers have taken the trouble to listen to people's concerns uh, and to get those right, and they'll set out the decisions that the government's made uh, in Parliament uh, in just over a week's time, so people don't have long to wait. You're talking there about um, people's concerns over free speech. I mean, Kemi Badenoch, for example, of your own uh, Cabinet uh, colleague, uh, saying over the summer we should not be legislating for hurt feelings. There's worry about this on the Conservative side, right? Well, look, there's been a debate uh, uh, amongst lots of people about getting the balance right. Now, legislation, there are no... On these sort of difficult subjects, there are no easy answers. It's about balancing different things that you have to be concerned about. Protecting children is very clearly what the government wants to do. Um, and then it's dealing with the other issues, but making sure that you don't uh, clamp down on free speech. So there's a balance to strike there. And as I said, the government will set out... Uh, you know, where, where we've made decisions uh, in just over a week's time in Parliament when the legislation comes back for a further full day of debate. Are you not telling us whether it's just children or if it's adults as well because you don't know or because you just don't think we should be told yet? No, I'm telling you, there's a proper process in Parliament. You know, as a former Chief Whip, uh, I happen to think it's quite important that when ministers set out policies, uh, that they set them out in Parliament first, where members of Parliament can hold them to account on behalf of their constituents. You know, there'll be people in Parliament who have been campaigning on these issues. Ministers can set out the detail, because on these subjects, the detail matters, and they can set out what the government proposes in detail, and then there's a full debate in Parliament uh, on Monday the 5th. OK. Now, talking about um, harmful behaviour, there's another story that I want to talk to you about, mm -hmm. and this is the report into misogyny and racism in the London mm -hmm. Fire Brigade. And I'll be honest, you know, I've been a journalist for many years. I've been genuinely quite shocked by some of the examples that this review uncovered. You know, like a Muslim firefighter having pork sausages put in his pocket, a woman having her helmet filled with urine. Um, Nazir Afzal, who was the man leading mm. the review, has said that he's been contacted by lots yeah. of people from you know, the BBC, the NHS, police forces. He wants to see a national inquiry now into other public bodies. Do you agree with him? Well, look, on the London Fire Brigade issue specifically, I listened to the examples that were set out, and frankly, they were absolutely appalling. Uh, you know, I, I worked in business before I was in politics, and that behaviour just wouldn't be acceptable in any workplace. Um, I was heartened to listen to what the commissioner of the London Fire Brigade said, which is that he accepted the report in full, accepted there was a big job of work to do in his organisation, and he made it clear that, that that job started now, and he was clear that he was going to root out people who behaved in such a way, uh, and I thought that was very good. Now, and he talked it, about criminal charges as well, didn't he? Yes, and it was obviously that, that inquiry was triggered by a specific case, I understand, of the, of the tragic uh, suicide of someone who took their own life as a result of 
bullying, and that's what triggered the report. Uh, I don't know of any similar examples elsewhere. So I think, look, the important thing here is I've listened to what was set out in that report. There's clearly some real issues in the London Fire Brigade, but the leadership of the London Fire Brigade, the Commissioner, has made it very clear that he, he's going to accept all the recommendations in full uh, and he's going to make it his mission to sort out that organisation. And that's the sort of leadership I think that you want when issues are identified. I guess my question about widening it out is because <coughs> it feels like, you know, whenever we start lifting up stones, whether it's mm -hmm. in the London Fire Brigade, whether it's in the Met Police, this kind of thing is uncovered. Shouldn't we start effectively turning up more stones elsewhere? Well, look, I think one thing that comes through very clearly from this, and that came through from the Commissioner's reply, is a lot of these things are about leadership. So I think what that report highlights, every leader of every organisation, I think, should read that report and just think about whether the way they conduct themselves and the way they lead their organisation means that that sort of behaviour wouldn't be able to happen in their organisation. But that, do you think that's that there should... That's something all leaders, I think... But do you think do. there should be more inquiries? I mean, it can't just be happening in London, can it? Well, look, uh, that, that inquiry was set up as the, res the, the response to a specific set of okay. events, so I don't think you want every organisation uh, in the entire country when there hasn't been a specific event to be setting up inquiries all over the place. But I do think all leaders of organisations should look at that report and think about whether it could happen in their organisation, and if they think it could, then they should think about what they need to do about making sure it, it couldn't. OK, uh, let's talk transport, uh, shall we? You are the Transport Secretary, after all. Uh, the UK is facing more rail strikes. How were your talks this week with the RMT's Mick Lynch? Well, well look, if I just said it in context, I think the difference with the rail uh, situation, the rail dispute and the strikes that have arisen, is that there's some. this is a long-running uh, dispute, far too long running actually. And what this is about is about modernising the railways. So there are a lot of practices in the railways that we, we don't see elsewhere. You know, we don't have, for example, a railway that runs properly on seven days. It depends on lots of goodwill from workers coming in on days that are what, they, what are called rest days. So what we're trying to do is modernise the railway, uh, make it more efficient and make it more flexible to deal with what passengers need. That's the important thing, what passengers need. That then frees up savings, and those savings will then be available to help give workers a pay rise and also free up some money that can then go back to the taxpayer, which is having to subsidise the rail industry. So that's what the negotiations between employers and trade unions are about. And what I, what I, the reason why I met Mr Lynch and Mr Ward from the TSSA this week was to just try and help move that process. So my job, I think, is to encourage the two sides in the negotiations to reach a conclusion. It's not my job to do the negotiations, but I'm very happy on behalf of the public to do what I can to get us to a resolution of the dispute. So what, how were the talks then? They can't be that great because the strike's still going ahead. Well, look, I think it was the first time I'd met Mr, Mr. Lynch uh, and Mr Ward and we had very uh, sensible discussions, very constructive. Uh, uh, that's what I thought, that's what he thought. Um, and how I'm... do you know it's what he thought? Well, because he came out onto the steps of the department after the meeting and that's what he said. Uh, so I'll take him at his, his word at face value. We had a very constructive conversation uh, and I want to see the trade unions get back round the table and I hope we can make enough progress so that they would feel able to call off those strikes. I know how damaging they are for passengers, uh, also not just for passengers but for all those businesses. I'm very struck by the hospitality industry uh, how important Christmas is for the hospitality industry. You know, I stood up for the hospitality industry last Christmas when there were rumours, you know, people wanted to close down the country again. The Prime Minister, when he was Chancellor, stood up for the hospitality industry and we want to protect them, which is why we want to see an end to this dispute. Um, you mentioned there are obviously strikes going on elsewhere. I know there's a specific situation, as you say, with rail workers, but they mm. obviously want to see a pay rise as well. Do you think public sector workers should expect to see their pay keep up with inflation? Well, look, I can understand why that's what people want to achieve, but I think we do have to set it in context. So we're facing a very difficult economic situation. Uh, there's the, the getting the economy back on track after the pandemic. There's the war in Ukraine. It's worth remembering that the economy, the amount we're spending on dealing with higher energy prices, it's the equivalent of a whole new national health service, right? So that's the economic context. We had an autumn statement where we got the public finances back on track stabilise the economic situation. We're seeing interest rates now not having to rise as much as they would otherwise have to do. Um, that, that is the context. So I think we want to make sure people have pay rises, but they've got to be pay rises that are affordable for the public sector and in the, the wider economic context. So 
Are you effectively saying then that an inflation matching pay rise is unaffordable in the public sector? Yes, I think inflation matching or inflation busting pay rises are unaffordable. And I think we want to try and give all the workers in the public sector who work very hard decent pay rises but they can't be inflation-busting pay rises. The there simply isn't the money to pay for those, but at the same time, given you know, the context. In, in the and, autumn... and by the way, we haven't seen those in the private sector either. The private sector pay rises have generally been um, settled below the level of inflation as well, which I but accept we is do... difficult for people, but there is just some honesty, I think, if we're straight with people about the economic context the country faces. At the same time, in the autumn statement, we did see some uh, inflation-matching increases in people's incomes. So if you're looking at, for example, pensions, they're going to rise in line with inflation. Benefits too, including out-of-work benefits. You know, if it's good enough for people who are not working, why isn't it good enough for people who are working? Well, look, we, we made a commitment in the manifesto about the triple lock for pensions, which we, you remember, we suspended for one year when there were some anomalies in the statistics and it was important to put that back. And, of course, pensioners have no ability to uh, alter their hours or take any steps to increase their income. And, of course, a most of the people who are on uh, benefits, people on universal credit, for example, a huge proportion of them, of course, yeah, aren't which, working. Which is why I specifically talked about out-of-work And they're benefits. working on low wages, uh, often, uh, and working incredibly hard to put food on the table. And they're, of course, on the lowest incomes. And it's the other reason, of course, why the national living wage is going up significantly. That'll give a £1,600 pay rise, I think, to those who are on the lowest incomes but working hard. Okay. Uh, and that, those are the steps the government can take. But you've got to be honest with people. You, the public purse won't... Uh, afford inflation-busting pay rises for everybody in the public sector. OK, um, just finally on transport. I, we, you know, whenever I say that I'm talking to the transport sector, there's so many people who get in touch with their horror stories, yep. effectively, of using uh, the transport <laughs> system in the United Kingdom. So I just want to play you one example okay. of many that we could play. Let's have a listen. Yeah, I've got to go home and see my son and I've pre-booked my tickets to get them cheaper to find out that my train from here to Doncaster was cancelled. So I had to purchase another ticket for £25. And then when I got to the station this morning at Andover, I found out that my train from Andover to London Waterloo had been cancelled. So now I've got a two-hour wait between trains and I've had, to, I've had to fork out an extra £60. Oh. I mean, I just want to play this because everyone's going to have a story like this. You know, is our rail system really fit for purpose? Look, I, I completely sympathise with that woman and her experience. I've had experiences yeah. like that myself. Part of the point, I think, actually, all those stories absolutely back up the case for reform, workforce reform, and modernising how our railways operate. I mean, at the moment, okay. we're far too dependent on, you know, expecting drivers to work on their rest days. We need a proper seven-day railway that works efficiently seven days a week, that people can count on for their important appointments, whether it's for family visits like that lady there, okay. or for going to work. OK, now, uh, just before we move on to a little bit uh, more uh, detail on the Conservative Party, just quickly, on uh, Manston, the Immigration yes. Centre, uh, we have had, of course, reports of someone very sadly dying from diphtheria. Mm -hmm. Has enough care been taken there? Well, look, we, we take the care of, of people, the welfare of people in our care, very seriously. I know the... UK Health Security Agency has been working very closely with the NHS. And my understanding is the, uh, the, the numbers, of course, at Manson have now been brought back down to the proper levels. Uh, on the diphtheria issue, there's extremely low risk to the wider community. That's a disease which, of course, the vaccination for which is in the standard childhood vaccination package. So the Health Security Agency... But is care... What about people in these centres? You know, is, is enough care being taken of them and well, their health? We take the welfare of people in our care very seriously. My understanding is those cases were people who had that disease before they came to the United Kingdom. And, of course, as I said, the Health Security Agency is working very closely with the NHS to make sure we look after the people that have been identified with diphtheria to make sure that they get the treatment and care that they need. And if they're identified, are they then tracked? Are we, do we keep tabs on them? Uh, well, the appropriate steps will be taken by the Health Security Agency. The point of getting the Health Security Agency involved is to make sure we take the proper steps, both to protect okay. the individuals, but also to make sure that we look after the wider community. Uh, now, Rishi Sunak has uh, been in power for you know, just a matter of weeks, uh, I guess. Um, and so far, it's been pretty steady as he goes. You know, nothing to rock the markets. Um, one Conservative source telling The Times on Saturday that boring is the new sexy, is it? Well, look, I think what he's about is a government that's grown up, that grips the issues that people are concerned about, gets on with governing. I mean, look, I accept that 
the summer was difficult. Uh, and I think what we need it's to do is get our heads down, grip the issues that people are concerned about, like that lady and the issue she's got about the rail service. You know, that's what I'm doing as the Transport Secretary, gripping the issues, dealing with them and having a government that people think is on top of the issues of the day and getting on with sorting them out I for the public at home. The only issue is there hasn't really been anything to move the dial either. I just want to have a look at the latest poll tracker. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the YouGov uh, tracker poll. <coughs> uh, and, you know, there has been a bit of a narrowing, you can see, uh, in the polls, mm -hmm. but it's nowhere near the levels that you need if you are going to have a chance of winning the next election. I mean, is boring just the new boring? Well, look, I think if we're being realistic about it, you're not going to, you're not going to turn things around overnight. I think, to be fair, to the public, the public uh, after the events of the summer want to see a period of sensible grown-up government. And if I look at how the two party leaders rate up between Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer, I think Rishi Sunak has very strong uh, uh, ratings on dealing with the, the economic it's challenge. miles behind Labour, uh, and also, to the Well, polls. that's the party thing, but the, the ratings of the Prime Minister are actually ahead of the Leader of the Opposition. You know, so I think that, that means I think people are prepared to listen to what we've got to say. But not but, everyone shares your point of view, but they're going they? to be, But look, they're going to be sceptical. People are going to be sceptical about it, and that's fine. Including so we're in going to have own... to demonstrate grown-up, competent government, and that's how we'll win people back um, ahead of the next election. There's skepticism in, in your own party as well, though, isn't there? You know, S. McVeigh saying the autumn statement was the final nail in the Conservatives' election chances. Sir John Redwood, I can't believe the Prime Minister will want to fight an election with promises of tax rises and austerity to come. That won't woo the voters back. And just to read out a list of the Conservative MPs who said they're going to stand down at the next election, William Ray, Chloe Smith, Gary Street, Nigel Adams, Charles Walker, Crispin Blunt, Adam Freer, Dehenna Davison. It's not exactly a glowing vote of confidence from your own side. Well, well look, I'd say a couple of things. On the colleagues that are standing down, the, the reason why those are coming out all in one go now, I mean, it's quite normal that as you get towards an election, various people, for their own reasons, decide they're not going to stand again. But there's a specific deadline in place. Because of the boundary changes, the parties asked colleagues to say whether they're going to stand um, and set that out before the 5th of December. So, you know, you're going to see it, those all bunched together. So I don't think there's anything particular to write home about that. Uh, on the fact that we face very difficult decisions, I mean, look, the autumn statement was difficult. I think, you know, the Chancellor said a number of times that he was having to take difficult decisions. The point of that is to level with the country about the challenge we face. You know, these are global challenges. A third of the world is going to be facing recession. Uh, you know, two-thirds of the the developed countries have inflation above 7%, facing exactly the same challenges that we do. What the country wants to know is that they've got a government and a prime minister that grips those challenges, takes the decisions that are necessary to get us on a path for long-term growth. Okay. And that's what we saw in the autumn statement last, a couple of weeks ago. Now, you're a former chief whip, as you mentioned earlier in the uh, interview. Uh, Matt Hancock had the Conservative whip suspended when he entered the jungle for I'm a Celebrity, but he's now made the final. Um, so if, if the public forgave him, do you think the Conservative Party should? Should he have the whip restored? Well, look, uh, one thing as the former chief whip is that I'm not going to tell the current chief whip how to do his job. And look, I still hold the position that I held when I was first asked about Mr Hancock um, at the beginning. If you're a Member of Parliament, uh, and Parliament is sitting, I, I think your job is to be representing your constituents either in your constituency or in Parliament. I don't think serving members of Parliament should be taking place in reality television programmes. You know, however well they do on them, I still think they should be doing the job for which they are paid a good salary, which is representing their constituents. And, you know, that's the position I hold. But, look, it, it, the public's going to make a decision about how that program shapes up. I mean, I have to confess I haven't been watching it, so I'm not quite fully up to speed with what's been going on. Uh, at the but, same time, uh, though, don't, shouldn't you believe in second chances? I mean, you, you know, you resigned from Cabinet yourself, didn't you, after it was found that your uh, cleaner didn't have permission to work in the UK? You're now back in the Cabinet. Shouldn't Matt Hancock have a second look, chance? I think the chief, that's a decision for the Chief Whip, and one of the things I respected when I was Chief Whip was that former Chief Whips didn't tell me how to do my job, so I'm going to let the Chief Whip make okay. those decisions, I think, and I think he'll be grateful that I'm not interfering. Understood. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Tough time of it. They managed to get through COVID. Uh, Mark Harper there, uh, Transport Secretary, um, saying that actually, uh, in his view, uh, inflation matching or inflation busting pay rises in the public sector are unaffordable. Well, it's our chance now to talk to our Deputy Political Editor, uh, Sam Coates, just to try and find out what really stood out to him uh, from our main political interview this morning. Uh, Sam, what did you make of Mark Harper? Good morning, Sophie. Well, Mark Harper talked about second chances. Really, the question is whether or not the public are going to end up giving 
the Conservatives a second chance. What really struck me wasn't one particular news line out of your interview, though there were many. It was the tone. And Mark Harper, like the wider Rishi Sunak government, is just adopting a much calmer, perhaps understandably, tone when dealing with problems. But it's a lot more managerial. It's a lot less punchy. It's uh, a lot less fighty. It's a lot less... Um, it, it, it's not designed to get the kind of uh, the heart pumping and the blood flowing. Essentially, what they're saying is, we know there are big problems now. Give us some time to sort that out. And that's whether that's uh, letting the fire brigade sort themselves out. It's whether it's sorting out the long-running strikes dispute. It's whether there's a, a sort of calm attempt to deal with public sector pay, they think a new tone will ultimately go down well with the public. But there isn't much sign of the public buying it yet when it comes to the wider Conservative Party. Indeed, in parts this week, there's just been that smell of death with the uh, number of Tory MPs standing down. Mark Harper rightly says part of that is because of a deadline. But you've got to look like, uh, you've got to look at questions why young Conservative MPs with a strong trajectory and a large majority are standing down if they want, uh, uh, if they see the Conservative Party as a party with a future. I think Rishi Sunak's team needs to make politics a bit more exciting, or otherwise Keir Starmer, previously derided as perhaps the uh, more uh, beige member uh, of, the, uh, of the fight to be in number 10 next time, uh, could actually end up getting an edge.